singing, I'm glad I know who Jesus is.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Let's all stand together, try and greet someone tonight. That's really glad to see them. The teenagers can make your way up as the adult choir comes down. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for being here. And visitors, thank you uh, for being here tonight. Good to see you in the Lord's house. And it's just good to be here on this midweek service. And, uh, fellas, I, I failed to get back there and mention this to you, but when we vote on something uh, in the church, um, and even if it's a, a love offering or whatever it is, but just turn the, turn the uh, Internet off for a minute. And uh, if we get any complaints, and we can... Call the pastor, amen. But uh, I just don't want all that stuff for all the world to see because it, it'll be, you know, out there and, and it stays on for a while. So um, just for the protection of those that we uh, take offerings for or do something for, I don't want them to get the idea they can come to freedom and get an offering. Amen. amen. <laughs> That's not the case. So um, when those things happen, just cut it off, all right? Uh, just a few announcements before our teen choir is going to sing. Freedom Kids Adventure Landing Trip, uh, Saturday, May 6th from 9.30 to 12.30. Uh, the cost is six fifty. That money has to be turned in tonight, so please get that in. Uh, Connie will be in the church office after the service to accept money. Connie, will you just raise your hand right quick for those who may not know you? Okay. Uh, discipleship meeting, uh, Sunday afternoon, 5.15 p.m. in a New Life Bible class. Uh, this is Brother Clint's Sunday School Classroom downstairs. And if you need to know where that class is at, uh, please see him after the service. He'll give you directions. Graduation Sunday uh, in the a.m. service. Reception following in the p.m. service. We'll honor all our graduates uh, on Sunday. The fellowship building will be unlocked Saturday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, for those to decorate tables in the fellowship hall. So all those who are graduating, uh, you should have that information uh, by now. But if not, please, again, please see Brother Fredericks, and he will uh, instruct you. And if you don't know who he is, he'll be preaching tonight. Amen. So you can uh, see him after the service. Uh, if you're interested in helping with VBS this year, July 17th through 21st is the sign-up sheet in the vestibule. And uh, I love Brother Jimmy putting VBS announcements, uh, you know, in, in March uh, for, for July, don't you? I love it. You know what that tells me? He's excited about VBS. I love that. I wish everybody was excited about everything they did at church. And uh, that, he's excited about it. He wants to do it. And, uh, I mean, I'm thinking, can, you know, can we hold off on that meeting just one more week? You know, I'm thinking one more week. It's not till July. 
No, we can't hold on. It's VBS. We got to do that. Amen. And uh, I praise the Lord for people being excited about what God has given them to do in his house. Did you know Nehemiah said we're doing a great work? That's why I'm not going to come down to you, Sam Ballot, and Tobiah. This is the greatest thing we ever put our hands to. I don't care what you did today. It's not as important as what you do tonight. Guarantee it. And uh, may God in heaven help us uh, to be faithful to his house. And I love our teenagers. Thank God for them. Got a bunch of them graduating this coming Sunday. They'll, we'll recognize them and excited about what the future holds for them. And they're going to sing for us tonight. And you pray for them as they sing. All right?
Some think of these as fables with no reverence today. But God's past power never passed away. The great I am. to make things right to strand his souls in darkness who long to see the light for those who tread a troubled road and feel they can't go on there's a promise we can stand upon choir. Let's all give my hand, shall we? Amen. Amen. That don't mean you can stop saying amen when I say you can clap, okay? We're not a clapping church. We're a saying amen church. But I want them to know they're appreciated and I thank the Lord. That was wonderful. I like that. The great I am. He is. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was good. Praise the Lord. And thank you, young people. Thank you so much for that. And the fellas come to this time for the offering. Go ahead and cut that off for a minute, fellas, if you will, in the back. As they're
All right, Isaac, you pray for us. Father, thank you for letting us gather here uh, once again um, under your roof in your house, Lord. And uh, just thank you for letting us be a church that uh, helps people and reaches out, Lord, and uh, gives when we can, Lord. Um, and just uh, thank you so much for uh, all that you've done, all that you're going to do, Lord. Thank you for uh, letting us see another service, another day, Lord. Just um, just thank you for all you do. Bless the gift and the giver. And just send and pray. Amen. <laughs> And we're going to get to our text in 1 Samuel. But let's start in Psalm 18, then we'll have the song come up here in just a second. For those of you enrolled in our second uh, block of discipleship courses, again, work with me, please. I, I, we originally were going to meet after church, but I totally forgot <laughs> we're honoring our high school seniors after Sunday night service. So that's why we're meeting on, um, at 515. So it'll be right downstairs in the basement, the New Life Bible class, and we'll meet there. Psalm 18, and then we'll have a word of prayer and listen to this group. The Bible says in verse 2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. That's a song we sing in our youth group a lot of times during camp finishes with verse 46 the lord liveth and blessed be my rock and let the god of my salvation be exalted these 50 verses if you have any type of study bible which means it has some notes in it or something most of them might have something written above verse number one in psalm 18 it might say something along these lines david the servant of the lord who spake unto the lord the words of this song in the day that the lord delivered him from the hand of of all his enemies from the hand of all his enemies so this was David this Psalm 18 was him singing this deliverance song if we could say it that way and so we're going to do some uh, fact checking right we're going to back up through the Bible and look through this I want us to see where this comes from and how it applies to our lives for us so we'll get ready to enjoy this song let's turn our Bibles to 1 Samuel 17 and then we'll see where the origin of this song of deliverance begins. Let's have a word of prayer. And then once the song is over, we'll come back and preach from 1 Samuel chapter number 17. Let's pray. Father in heaven, tonight I ask, Lord, these next few moments that you would help the scripture to be open, help us to see it as clearly as you've placed it in there for us. And then, God, may we apply it to our lives. I ask, Lord, that you be with this group about to sing. Thank you for Ashlyn and her work to practice and then perform for us and then the teen choir and even our church choir. Such a refreshing feeling to come in and hear songs of Zion be sung and get us ready for the preaching of your word. So would you bless now the remainder of our service. We ask these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.
I've got a heart that's full of faith it filled helplessness And there are mountains ahead that I can't move by myself But I know when I'm weak, He's strong When I can barely breathe, there's still a song Even though it's hard right now I'm not here on my own So when it seems it can't be done I know God is big enough I can run the race I'm called to run Cause I know God is big enough He'll finish everything He starts He'll meet us right here where we are And I can feel faith rising up Cause I know God is big enough On the days that the shadows of doubt make me feel small And I declare that I don't stand in my strength at all Cause I won't live a day you didn't plan Every single moment is in your hand even if the whole world shakes, you're the rock on which I stand. So when it seems it can't be done, I know God is big enough. I can run the race I'm called to run, cause I know God is big enough. He'll finish everything He starts. He'll meet us right here where we are. I can feel faith rising up Cause I know God is big enough Bigger than the fear that surrounds me Bigger than the chains that have bound me Bigger than the story my past could tell Bigger than the weight of tomorrow Bigger than the lies I've told myself So when it seems it can't be done I know God is big enough I can run the race I'm called to run Cause I know God is big enough He'll finish everything He starts He'll meet us right here where we are And I can feel faith rising up so when it seems it can't be done, I know God is big enough. I can run the race I'm called to run, cause I know God is big enough. He'll finish everything He starts, He'll meet us right here where we are. And I can feel faith rising up, cause I know God is big enough. big enough all right thank you tabitha jeremy and miss jennifer on the piano thank you for your hard work here we go we're in first samuel chapter 17 at least i hope you are we're going to try to find the origin of this song of deliverance that david was singing that we saw recorded in psalm 18 and as we get ready to look at these verses in 1 Samuel 17, uh, it's probably one of the most well-known Bible stories if anybody's been at church for any length of time, okay? So as we get ready to look at this story of David and Goliath, it reminds me of an archaeologist who was digging in the desert and came across a mummy, uh, a casket with a mummy in it. He immediately called the uh, prestigious uh, curator of the Natural uh, History Museum, and he simply says, I think I've got a 3,000-year-old mummy here who died of heart failure. And the curator says, all right, well, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, if you could bring this by, I'd like to examine it, and I'll call you back in a week and see if we can figure this out. So he dropped the casket off, and uh, a week later, the curator called him back and says, I, I don't really, or do you have any, any background in studying this stuff? He says, well, what do you mean? He says, well, this thing's about, this body's about 3,000 years old, and from what we can tell just by some of the testing we've done, that it looks like it did die of cardiac arrest, heart failure, something. It just, 
How did you figure that out? He said, well, there was a piece of paper in his hand that says, I've got 10,000 shekels on Goliath. <laughs> the upset of all time, David versus Goliath. And so let's look here at 1 Samuel 17. And the Bible says, first of all, look in verse 38. We're just getting to the foundation of this song here. Verse 38 says, And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass on his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword with, upon his armor, and he essayed to go. It means he didn't want to go. For he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. So remember, Saul should have gone to battle, but David's the one that winds up going, who is this guy that defies God? I'll go out there and take him. And so Saul's like, okay, here's my chain mail, here's my helmet, here's my sword, and David puts it all on. So it's like, uh, it's like Daniel Ritchie trying to wear Mitchell Church's clothes. <laughs> and he took about three steps before any of the clothes started to move, and he says, you know what, I ain't wearing this, sorry, I'm done. And uh, he goes, well, what do you have? And so in verse 40, it says this. He took a, verse 40 says, and he took his staff in his hand, and he chews him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a, in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now jump down to verse 49. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it. Amen, southern reading right there. And smote the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone sunk in his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed. So we know this story. David kills Goliath. Then, right after this great victory, uh, Saul becomes envious. Okay? We're just going to jump ahead an 18-year time period here when Saul becomes envious of David and literally wants to kill him. During this same time, Saul's son, Jonathan, befriends David and even protects David by giving him information. My dad's not too happy with you. Brother Jim, good to see you tonight. Grateful you're in church. Been praying for your wife and family during this time. And to see you up there, my mother leaned over and goes, Jim Wilson's in the choir singing. I thought they had a heartache. I said, they did. And it sure was a blessing to see you, and we're still praying for you and your family, Jim. Um, King Saul, uh, son Jonathan, uh, now back to our regularly scheduled sermon. Uh, Jonathan is in, in, in almost sells, helps him, and David flees. David goes to, to flee for his life. Several times Saul was very wroth with David, the Bible says, even threw a javelin towards him, a spear. So David goes to hide out, and in uh, the hiding, Saul goes out on some battle. Saul goes out even to look for David a few times. Saul goes to take a nap in a cave, in a very cave where David seems to be hiding out, in which David can go right now and end his running. And he says, no, I won't raise my hand on God's anointed, and he let it go at that. And David then goes to hide out with a group of people called the Philistines. The same group of people that David, years prior, went to fight against the champion with, he's now hiding with them. They make a response and say, what are these Hebrews here? What are they doing hanging out here? They don't belong. Even the world knows that it ain't right for those Christians to be here. And as he's hanging out with these Philistines and he says, no, no, listen, I, I'm not going to turn. I'm just looking to hide out. I got some things going on. Uh, while he's hanging out with these folks, the country where his, his families are and the men that are with him, their wives and children are in a place called Ziklag. And while in Ziklag, it is attacked by the Amalekites who come in and David and his men get out of the Philistine garrison and start to head back towards Ziklag and they can see the smoke as they get closer to the city. And as they get there, you can imagine their hearts had sunk into their stomachs and they looked around. The, the morale was at an all-time low. David goes to pray and says, Lord, what shall we do? And God says, pursue and David encouraged himself in the Lord and encouraged these men and said, guys, we're going to go back. And the Bible specifically states that when they went and caught up to the Amalekites, that they went to battle and they recovered all. They recovered all, every spouse, every child, every, they recovered it all, now living in obedience to God. David and these folks, finally, after they recover all, word gets back that Saul has died 
and they inquire to bring David back, and they, they make David the next king of Israel. And David is now the king, and just a chapter or two after he's coronated king, we have the next famous story or infamous story of David's life with David and Bathsheba. And at the time in which kings go forth to battle, David tarried still at Jerusalem. And while he was hanging out there, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time and did the wrong thing. And God said, I'm going to punish you. He said that through the prophet Nathan and uh, gave an illustration about a shepherd who took some ewe lambs and he had plenty of sheep his own, but he stole these. And God says, that's going to be your punishment now, David. And after that, the baby that Bathsheba was expecting with, they lost that baby. Then uh, their children that are born out, Tamar is one of David's daughters and she winds up becoming raped by a half-brother. And then there's another brother, Absalom, who winds up killing that brother out of anger. And then Absalom starts a coup, an insurrection, and says, you know what, I don't know why my dad's king anyway, why don't we do this? And he takes off and starts to get his folks to rally around him and says, we're going to take over my dad's kingdom. And there's a, there's a, there's a, the first church split takes place there in Israel. Absalom the son and David his dad. And in all this, David tries to hang out and... The word gets back that his son Absalom winds up being killed himself. The grief that David consumed with Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, oh, that I would have died for thee. That's an 18-year time period. And now David, back in Israel, back on the throne, not running, not chasing, is now king and just doing kingly duties. And so we jump ahead 18 years and go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 21. Everything I just said to you from David and Goliath to now Absalom passing away and probably a three-year famine and now David on charge here, he's finishing up his life. And we come to chapter 21, verse number 15. And the Bible says, moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down. And his servants with them and fought against them, uh, fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. The desire to fight was still there, but the athleticism wasn't there, right? All of us who get older, we always make this statement, the older I get, the better I was, right? And uh, whether it's basketball or, or some sport like that, and uh, we just go, man, I remember when I used to be able to get up and down the court a few times without having to get oxygen and things. That's where David was. He waxed faint. And as the battle was wearing down, the normal Philistine war uh, uh, way they would go to war and go to battle was, well, let's not go to war with all of our people. Let's do a little one-on-one, -on -one, much like they did in the Valley of Elah when Goliath went out to challenge them. So here we come again. Look at verse 16. And Ishbi Banab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass and weight, he, being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. So you, now you see the scene. They're, they're going to battle with the Philistines again, and Ishbi Banab comes out, Brother Mark, and he weaves that big spear. And he can remember all those 18 years ago when Goliath went out there to fight. Goliath was the champion. Maybe Ishbi Banab was the second or the third, or the fourth, who wasn't the champion, but he was thinking, someday I'll get to do this, and here he comes out. And 18 years thinking about what David did, and musing on that, and he just kind of comes up and waves that spear. I told our teenagers, we preached from this months ago, and I told them, that he, I'm sure he walked up and said, my name is Ishbi Banab. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And he's been saying that statement over and over and over again for 18 years waiting to find David. And he finally pulls his weaver beam out and gives that great statement. David, though he's faint, says, all right, here we go, boys, ready to go again. And his nephew, Abishai, jumps up. Remember Abishai? He's, he's one of David's mighty men. He's one of the 30 and, uh, and he was the one that when Shimei came in and started cursing out David, ah, oh, you dog, I can't believe you. She, uh, Abishai, let me, let me lop his head off. And David says, no, no, let him go. So here Abishai, look at verse number 17. 
the son of Zariah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. David, as our king, we appreciate you being here and wanting to go fight, but Abishai took care of that guy, and we'll take care of the rest of them. You just tell us how to do it and what to do. So David knocks out the giant Goliath. Abishai knocks out Ishbi Banab here. But we're not done. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then <laughs> Sibachai, the Hushatite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giants. So here's a third giant. And he got taken out. Look at verse 19. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where Elaham, the son of Jerry Oregon, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So now we have a fourth giant that was taken out here. Let's finish up, verse 20. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature, and had on every hand six-fingered. It's the six-fingered swordsman. <laughs> and, and, and he had six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. And he also was born... To the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, not Jonathan, Saul's son, best friend of David, there's like 15 Jonathan, so you got to make sure you research this and figure it out. But he also was one of uh, David's men who, actually, it was David's nephew, to be honest, and the Bible tells us this in the next verse. But um, when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David, and by the hand of of his servants. So we see the, that, that these giants were taken care of here. And I don't know, Brother Jimmy, part of me may think that maybe that's why David put five stones out of the river. When he got five smooth stones, he was probably thinking, these boys probably don't fight fair. And if I get rid of Goliath, I got to be ready in case Ishbi Banab steps up. And if Ishbi Banab steps up, I got another rock in the pouch. And if he goes down, then I got to be ready for Saf. And I got to be, you know, just always planning and preparing. So as we read these verses, now let's enjoy David's song of deliverance from Psalm 18. Look at chapter number 22 of 2 Samuel. Right there, 2 Samuel 22. And the Bible says, And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies. He didn't give David this song after Goliath. He didn't give David this song when he was crowned king. He didn't give David this song after Psalm 51 when he was restored after sinning. He gave David this song when all of his battles were done. All I can say is that if you're coming out of a difficult time right now and you're just still wondering, when's God going to give me that peace that passeth all understanding, it probably means, can I say this in a good way, you got more battles ahead of you. The Bible specifically says that delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies, out of the hand of Saul, and he said, does this sound familiar? The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. I know my God is big enough. The great I am. Jump down with me to verse 18, please. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. They were too strong for me. You know, there's a lot of battles I think we're trying to fight that we should just step back and let God handle it. 
Verse 19. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. Tonight I'm just going to quickly just give you three points on this. Overcoming all the giants in our life. Overcoming all the giants in our lives. Not just the Goliaths, but the Ishbi Banabs and the Safs and, the, and all the giants. I want us to say, let's get ready to conquer them all. How do we do this? God gives us a simple outline right here. First of all, look at verse number, uh, uh, verse 20. The first way we do this is you become delivered because he is delighted. You will become delivered when God is delighted. Look at verse 20. He brought me forth into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. What does God want me to do with my life? You know what God wants you to do? Put a smile on his face. He wants you to put a smile on it. Our deliverance is based on his being delighted with us. Now remember, uh, uh, he, we, he created us for his pleasure. Revelation 4.11, I'll read it for you. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I was not created for Debbie Sherboneau. Debbie Sherboneau was not created for me. We were created for God. But along the ways, he said, I want you to, to have each other, till this, uh, to have and to hold from this day forward till death do you part. And now I want you both to give me glory and honor and power. Put a smile on my face. That's what God does. And when you do that, God then says, I'll deliver you. Yeah, well, God ain't done that for me yet. Listen to yourself. I wouldn't be delighted hearing someone go this. When are you going to get us out of here? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? How much longer? Are we there yet? I got to use the bathroom. How much longer? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we? Any parent on any road trip starts to go, where's the pillow? Put, just put it over his face and let, let's, let's get going for a little bit. And you're wondering why you, God delivers when he's delighted. Jim, I can't help but think, as difficult as it is, how delighted God the Father must have been looking down and going, you know what, I, I would have understood if he just laid out tonight. I would have understood if he just needed to help take care of Miss Reba and the rest of the family. I, I, but man, I sure do like that. And a delight to God like that helps to give someone deliverance. It doesn't take the pain away. It doesn't take away the hurt and the sorrow. But it can help when we delight. You think you need to win the battle, but you just need to be prepared for the battle. And God will do the rest. You just need to be prepared for it. Do your part. And David took five stones just to say, okay, I don't know what's going to happen here, but I'm ready. I'm prepared, and God says, I got the rest. Just fling it up in the air. I'll put it in his forehead. I'll smack him on the back and make him fall down, and I'll give you the strength to lift his sword and lop his head off. And then he's got four other brothers, or, and two, two brothers and two sons. I'll tell you what, you just be there, but you won't even have to raise a hand against them, David. I'll take care of them. We just need to prepare. We think we need to win all these battles where God just says, no, I just want you to be prepared, and that delights God. That delights God. I'm getting to the point now my kids are growing up and I won't be able to watch them play sports anymore in high school. And Tiffany and Tab, as much as I love y'all, I praise the Lord for that. I have a very difficult time watching girls' sports. I'm not a male chauvinistic pig. It's just very hard. I remember the first JV basketball game watching my Tiffany play. Woohoo! yeah. At the end of regulation... It was tied six to six. Four quarters of basketball, JV girls, it was tied six to six. And I'm thinking, 
we're going to overtime. <laughs> I've got to watch more of this. At the end of overtime number one, Brother Jeff, it was still six to six. They played a second overtime. Still six to six. Now, something must have happened in that, after that second. I bet the coaches just said, let's stop playing defense, guys. We all got to go home sometime tonight. Because, like, the final score was 16 to 14. They scored more points in that third overtime than they did in a four-quarter game and two overtimes combined. Any of you have kids, you know what I'm saying. Uh, I want to be clear when I state this, and that's why I wrote it down and highlighted it very well so I say it correctly. I never went to watch my kids to see if they would win or lose. I always went to see if my kids were going to give their best effort. As a parent, to go watch my kids play I'm hoping that they represent Christ and whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, regardless of the score. I watch my kids and see their response to a referee who may have not seen it the same way they did and make sure that they are exemplifying Christ. And I watch my kids to make sure that when their coach corrects them or pulls them out, that they don't stare at the coach or look at me at the stands and go, can you believe this coach? Because we do not defy authority. I'm watching to help my kids put a smile on my face. And I know I used a sports illustration, but I could say that for school, for awards, for academics, for plays, for when they go soul winning, when they go on visitation, they go on the bus route, they work in Tiny Tots, Little People's Bus Ministry, they go on a mission trip or in their places of employment. Because more than an outcome of a score, there's nothing better a parent loves to hear than when you go into a men's warehouse and your son doesn't know you're there and his manager goes, I tell you what, do you got more Tim Fredericks's somewhere that I could hire? Or your daughter's babysitting for someone and they just give them a glowing, radiant uh, uh, thank you. And man, I can't believe more. She needs to come back more. Blah, 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 blah. There's nothing that a parent loves more than when their kid satisfies them and puts a smile on their face. I enjoyed it when our kids won. And I tried to be comforting when our kids lost. But deep down inside, there was always a satisfaction of going, the team didn't fare that well, but I know my son or daughter did the best they could. And that's as a parent all I can do. And that's where we talk about being delivered because he's delighted. No outcome ever gave me as a parent more pleasure than to hear someone compliment my child's effort. No outcome. No 40-point win, no 40-point loss ever was able to go any higher than when someone compliments your child for their work ethic. It was a great day in my life when I realized God doesn't need me to win a victory. He just wants to know that I'm ready for battle. Remember, he doesn't really need us, but he does want to make sure we're doing our part. D.L. Moody used to say it this way, we had to work like everything depends on us and pray like everything depends on God. I think too many of us are just sitting back going, come on, God, start doing your deal. And God's up here going, I will, when you start doing yours. I'm not talking salvation. Salvation is all God. We know that. But these things that follow, let's quickly look at the second thing we see here. David was, first of all, delivered because he delighted his father. Secondly, he was rewarded according to his righteousness. And uh, we see that, of course, in verse 21. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. And so we're saved by his righteousness and what he did on the cross. However, we are blessed and rewarded here on earth by our righteousness. It's not a work salvation. It's a work blessing or curse. Moses taught the children of Israel this in Deuteronomy 11, verses 26 through 28, when he said, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. 
Micah 6, 8, another prophet in the Old Testament stood up to the children of Israel and said this, He has showed thee, O man, verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 8, He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before thy God. Do right till the stars fall. <laughs> There's a song. Is there, do you know that song, Miss Jennifer? Do right till the stars fall. Do you, okay. I remember when I went to teen service as a young person, we had some sweet lady in the youth meeting on Wednesday nights who would sing it. It seemed like a nightclub. Boy, the piano played a little bit slow, and she had this little microphone with a 700-foot cord. It just had, she had that Mrs. Roper hairstyle from this company and these big glasses, and she would always be a do right till the stars fall do right and we'd sit there going oh my goodness I hope the stars fall now and, uh, but, but as that all was going on I do remember this from the very start have purposed in your heart to do what's right and never question and to just say I'm going to do right do right do right do right do right and that's what God says here you will be rewarded to your righteousness Amen. do right do right. Can I tell you what 80% of counseling is? A uh, preacher, I was just, uh, do right. Yeah, but what, do right. Yeah, but what if, do right. 80% of it. Do right, do right, do right. Stop trying to fight the battles yourself and worry about being right with God. Uh, just worry about being right with God so he can fight the battle for you. Tab had foot surgery here and her doctor found out she golfed that was on the golf team and said, boy, here, here, lady. he's uh, Dr. Sprinkle. He calls her baby doll. Not real big on it, but hey, he calls everyone baby doll. Okay, baby doll, get your foot up here. Let's look at that. And he goes, let me, let me pay for you to get a golf lesson. And I uh, took her over and she met the lady over at the Forsyth Country Club and we got her golf lesson. She was chipping and as she was chipping, the lady, okay, I want you to hold this. Stay smooth and just come right here. Don't decelerate. Just go, swing right through it. The ball will lock. And so Tab was working on that and she'd get a few down and going and rolling real well. And all of a sudden she'd kind of duff one, kind of hit the ground, then hit the ball and it kind of sprinkle. But it hit a rock and then it hit the sprinkler and then it rolled over and it's getting closer and closer to the hole. And you could hear the coach saying this. You know what she's saying, Tab, right? No, 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 no. Don't reward bad behavior. No, don't reward bad behavior. Don't reward bad behavior. She's yelling at the golf ball. Don't get close to that hole because what's going to happen is tabs are start thinking, eh, I'm pretty good, man. No. You got lucky. And I think too many of us as Christians, to be honest, we're not really where we should be, yet somehow, someway, maybe it's a praying grandma or grandpa somewhere. Maybe it's just the grace of God. But I know this, God does not want to reward bad behavior. So when you're wondering when your deliverance is coming, let me ask you this, how's your behavior? Because the reward is for righteousness. Yeah, I tell you what, as soon as God starts showing up a little bit, I'll start listening a little more. God ain't coming into that smoke-filled temple. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, if God's really up there, yeah. I was thinking, Isaac, you buy your own drinks. Do you buy a fifth or do you buy them by the liter? <laughs> How many bubbles are in there when you shake it real good? You got to make sure. I watch Moonshiners. I know what I'm talking about. Okay. And um, don't reward. Any good parent should know you don't reward bad behavior. This making deals with our kids. Stop crying. Stop crying. Look, look. Okay. I've got, I've got, I've got a candy bar. And if you stop crying, I'll give you a candy bar because I don't want you to embarrass me out here in public and people to think I don't know. Blah, blah. Now, you're going to be, yeah, I'll be good. Okay. And you start to push the car. Ah, no, no, okay, look, I'll just give you one piece of the candy bar, but I'm not giving you the whole candy bar. Don't reward bad behavior. Don't reward bad behavior. Don't re yeah, but they're crying. Let them cry all the way to the car. Let them cry all the way in the car seat. Let them cry all the way until they get home, until you can correct them properly, and then say, nope, and then eat the candy in front of them. <laughs> then take the milk out of the fridge and don't even get a glass. Just drink it right out of the drug. <laughs> And I guarantee you, next time you go out to the grocery market, they're going to behave a lot better. You're out here wondering, God, when are you going to deliver me? When are you going to deliver me? And God just says, 
I'm here. And when you start acting right, then I'll reward you. Now, again, let's back up and make sure we're going to... This is for God's children. This isn't for the guy on the corner who does, who's not saved, all right? His main need is salvation. But after we get saved, and most of us, I believe, we're saved, after that, we got to start delighting God with our actions. we got to start having righteousness. And thirdly, let me finish. We're compensated for cleanness. And he says it in verse, end of verse 23. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. So we're compensated for cleanness. You ever make that big road trip? Now we got to stop. And any good dad realizes you don't pull off to use a restroom unless it's on the right side. Because I don't pull off if it's 1.3 miles. To, no, no, it's got to be right off the interstate so we can zoom off, use the facilities, and get back on and catch up to all those other cars that passed us while we had to go potty. <laughs> then you pull off, and then all of a sudden you realize, my goodness, which horror film did they film at this truck stop restroom? Now you got to find another, because you ain't going in that one. You know, you got to get the key, and it's, it's got a chain connected to a toilet seat, and you got to carry that thing out to a, the side door, and you open it, and the flies come out, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, uh, you know what? No, get back in the car, everyone. We got. Why? It ain't clean. I need a clean facility. We're stopping. We're going to be here. Oh, why ain't you? Oh, no, no, no. I want to use something for service. I want it to be clean. Why would God settle for anything less? I wonder if God would like to equip us for service. And he goes, Ew. Mm. Go get cleaned up. Go get cleaned up. Well, how do I get cleaned up? Your pastor's been teaching you how to get cleaned up for the last 11 Sunday mornings. Psalm 119. I'll just read a few verses. Verse number 9 through 16 says this. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all thy judgments out of my mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on thy precepts. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By doing what the book says. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Yeah, but preacher, can, can I get seven meetings lined up? One a week for the next seven weeks to help me overcome this. I'll give you the seven meetings if you promise to read your Bible every day. Well, you know, I'm a little bit busy, but I can be here for the meetings. No. We need to get cleaned up. Because if you're not going to listen to the Word of God, you're not going to listen to the man of God. Let me say that again. If you're not going to listen to the Word of God, you're not going to listen to the man of God because every principle and every precept and every judgment and everything that the man of God is going to tell you is from the Word of God. The compensation is not always financial. The compensation can be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. It can be a peace that just comes over you when you're in the midst of the worst storm you can imagine. Because you're saying, you said you'd take care of this, and I'm just glad I'm in this storm with you. And that's how you get delivered. Take the peace that passeth all understanding and enjoy the victories God has for you. David's closing song is a reminder for us all that we can overcome all the giants in our life if we remember that we were delivered only because he's delighted in us. 
We are rewarded according to righteousness and the right actions we do. And we're compensated for our cleanness. For our cleanness. Remember when you were younger and mama said supper time and you came running the house and whoa, 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 uh uh-uh, uh 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 you get outside there and you either start cleaning up or I'm gonna hose you off before you come into my newly mopped floor. Yeah. I wonder how many of us come in and we're like, oh God, come on, we're just full of soot. Let's get clean. So God can make us into what he wants us to be. Let's be prepared for every battle in front of us, but rest assured that he can take care of them for us because greater is he that is in you than he and any other giant that's in the world. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the scriptures. And God, we had to search the scriptures tonight. We had to jump around to find out where this song of deliverance came from. And maybe, God, because we know where that song of deliverance started from, You gave David that song when all of his battles were over. But you gave it to us before all of our battles were over. And so, God, may we learn from this song of deliverance that we would live to delight you. Put a smile on your face. That we would understand that rewarding comes from righteousness. And, God, may we just dedicate ourselves to be clean and holy vessels Meet for the master's use. I wonder tonight if there's anyone in here who maybe this whole thing has skipped over your head because you're not even a Christian. If that's the case, let's take care of that tonight. Do you know for certain you're on your way to heaven? If you don't, we can take care of that and show you from the Bible. And let you rest assured that you don't have to fight another battle the rest of your life. God will fight for his children. Maybe there's someone here tonight that you are a child of God and you need to work on delighting the Lord. Maybe you need to work on your righteous actions. Or maybe we just need to clean some things up. Either way, if you want deliverance, you're going to have to do those because that's what David said got him through. Our heads about to rise or close. Let's stand to our feet. The piano player's playing. Open time. Hello, Pastor White here. I want to thank you for tuning in to our live stream today. Uh, whether you watched it live or on YouTube, Uh, or maybe an archived sermon. Thank you so much for taking the time to do so. And I wanted to conclude the message today by telling you a few things uh, about how God feels about you and us in general. First of all, I want you to know today, if you're listening, God loves you. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that means you, friend. And so I want you to know today God loves you. The second thing I want you to know is that all of us are sinners. We've all missed the mark. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark, every one of us. The Bible also says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then in Romans 10.13, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to encourage you today, friend, there is hope for you. There's hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you'd like to talk to someone about trusting Christ as your Savior, you can do so. You can reach us at the church here at area code 336-969-6937. Or you can reach us on our website at freedombaptistrh.com where we'll have more information about salvation. And we'd love for you to let us know of your decision for Jesus Christ today. If you need prayer, if you need encouragement, please don't hesitate to call or email or visit our website. And we trust that that you'll find the help needed in the Lord Jesus Christ. May you have a wonderful day, and may God bless you. Thank you again for listening to our broadcast.